Dan Medig has been pastor at St. Sarkis in Douglaston for, I believe, 12 years now. He is a member of the Religious Council. He has, as you can read in his own weekly e-bulletin, a dynamic parish that has very much bridged the gap between the traditional Armenian ethnic church and the church needs of our parishioners and community today. Ternarek was chosen to give the keynote address, which I think was a wonderful idea. I thank the committee for doing that, and I'd like to present to you Ternarek to give his remarks at this time. There are certain events and people that shape our lives. These memories are rooted deep into our childhood. Our earliest experiences may stick with us for years and continue to influence us, to influence us into our adulthood. One of those memories that I have from my early days in the seminary is an Episcopal ordination. It was the spring of 1994. I had joined the seminary in the fall of 1993. I had never seen an ordination before. I remember the preparation and the rehearsals that the priest and the deacons were having. Even though I did not fully understand the importance of this event or what was going on, there was a sense of joy that everyone was experiencing. The day came and I finally saw Hayr Oshagan for the first time. It was a humbling experience to be part of that historic celebration, to witness the elevation of a servant in the church from the rank of priesthood to bishop. I witnessed, I witnessed Hayr Oshagan becoming Oshagan Serbazan. In one of my favorite books, the Road Less Traveled, A New Psychology of Love, Traditional Values, and Spiritual Growth, the author, Scott Peck, reflects on discipline and delaying gratification, as he writes. Delaying gratification is a process of scheduling the pain and pleasure of life in such a way as to enhance the pleasure by meeting and experiencing the pain first and getting it over with. It is the only decent way to live. I learned that lesson of delaying gratification from Oshagan Serpazan when I was a young seminarian in the summer of 1995 or 96. In that year, the Bible translating team was meeting in Big Fire, Lebanon. Zare Serpazan of blessed memory, Oshagan Serpazan and Vera Badbili Jimbashian were scheduled to meet daily in one of the rooms of the old building of the seminary to work on translating the Bible. Hai Shahan, our dean, assigned me to serve coffee and cookies to the translators during their mid-morning break. I was happy, not only because I was going to attend to three great scholars, but because I thought I could skip some time from our summer study sessions and also help myself with the cookies that I was going to serve. My plan was working fine. I was taking off a good 15 minutes from the study session, and those cookies tasted really good. Until one day, I pushed the limits. I left the study hour 30 minutes early, went to the kitchen, prepped my tray, and went to the translator's room. I was 15 minutes early. I said, coffee is ready but they could care less. Then Oshagan Serpazan told me, we don't take breaks until we reach the point that we agreed on when we first start. At that moment, I realized that I was in the presence of not only esteemed scholars, but also highly disciplined individuals who had mastered the art of delaying gratification. Committed individuals, who knew that translating the scriptures required enormous amount of time, energy, and other sacrifices. 
The end result of that disciplined and meticulous work was the publication of the New Testament, the book of Psalms, and the various scripture passages in modern Western Armenian, a monumental work for the benefit of everyone in the Armenian church. My admiration of Oshagan Serpazan grew further when I arrived in New York in January of 2002 to work at the prelacy as an Armenian secretary as well as to serve as a deacon. Two somber events helped me gain a deeper understanding of who Oshagan Serpazan is. The first event was the untimely passing of our former prelate, Mesrop Serpazan of Blessed Memory. It was a chilly autumn night when I got a phone call from Vaskan, who asked me to come to the prelacy office. It was a little after midnight when I got there. Hoshagan Serpazan opened the door and he broke the news to me. I can never forget his tone when he said, Amen in love and get us met up. I felt so helpless, but I was able to see a man of true emotions who was trying to process the grief of losing a lifelong friend. The second event was when Zara Serpazan of Blessed Memory came to New York for the last time. Oshagan Serpazan, Hairan Ushaban, and myself picked him up from JFK and drove to Manhattan. We had dinner at a fine Italian restaurant, and no one knew that that would be the final decent meal that Zara Serpazan would have. Shortly after his arrival, his health deteriorated and he became bedridden at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. I would visit him almost every day after work, only to find Oshagan Serpazan and Hairan Ushaban sitting next to him. On Armenian Christmas Eve of 2004, Oshagan Serpazan sang Chorurt Metz and delivered the Holy Communion to his best friend, Zara Serpazan. Oshagan Serpazan accompanied his friend on his final journey. Zara Serpazan's bedside was a holy grant for Oshagan Serpazan. His fraternal love and loyalty was the greatest implicit lesson to me on the value of true friendship. We're out of the woods now. Good. In December of 2003, my contemplations and prayers helped me crystallize my vocation to priesthood. I communicated my intentions to my mentor, Hairan Shaban, who respectively communicated them to Oshagan Serpazan. A few days later, Oshagan Serpazan called me to his office to have a brief conversation with me. He welcomed my decision and said the following, priests in our prelacy are like prelates. They are assigned to their parishes and they can do whatever they want. I found those words to be very encouraging, but also very challenging. I felt that my prelate was empowering me, but at the same time reminding me of the great responsibilities that were upon me. A year later, I came back to New York as an ordained priest. My first observation from my, from my early days of priesthood was that Oshagan Serpazan treated his, the priest of his prelacy with utmost respect. Every time I met him, I would greet him saying, Aspazoknagan, and he would say, Ortiader. His respect was never lip service, but a genuine sense of appreciation. I can speak on behalf of my clergy brothers and say, when comparing ourselves to priests from other jurisdictions, we have always felt that our prelate, Oshagan Serpazan, is behind us, supporting us, encouraging us, facilitating opportunities for our personal and professional growth. In the spring of 2006, a year after my installation as the pastor of St. Sarkis Church, I had the audacity to go to Oshagan Serpazan and ask him the permission to apply for a graduate program at St. John's University. Serpazan welcomed the idea but cautioned that I should be focusing my time on my parish. However, Serpazan said, maybe you should apply and take one course and see how it goes. Needless to say, I felt frustrated about the deal but still grateful for the opportunity. 
I submitted my application and was admitted. Soon thereafter, I had an appointment with my soon-to-be academic advisor, Dr. Frank Connolly Weinert. Five minutes into our conversation, and he said, maybe you should take one course and see how it goes. I said, have you been talking to my archbishop? And he said, I have no idea what are you talking about. <laughs> I finished my graduate studies in pastoral theology in the spring of 2010. I got my diploma and my transcripts and went to see Osha and Serpazan. This time, I was really nervous. Serpazan looked at my grades as I thanked him for the great opportunity. Then Serpazan asked, are you thinking about a PhD? I said, no, but I am thinking about another graduate program. Then I told Serpazan about the clinical mental health counseling program and why I wanted to pursue a study in that field. I knew my chances of approval were slim, but I wanted to give it a shot. Serpazan thought for a minute and then said, shot love, I will approve your request under one condition. I want you to become a licensed mental health counselor. There are no words that can explain the joy that I felt at that moment. Attending meetings with Oshagan Serpazan is another form of school for me. Navigating in delegate and tough situations where the inexperienced rookie is inclined to make abrupt decisions, you hear the sound comments of the seasoned prelate who invites you to see the bigger picture that advice is not only based on experience, but it is galvanized by compassion and biblical wisdom. Dear brothers and sisters, management experts define leadership as a process of influence. Anytime you are trying to influence the thoughts and the actions of others towards a new place or different outcome in either their personal or professional life, you are engaging in leadership. Oshagan Serpazan is a leader of that caliber. In an age where leadership is confused with narcissism and cheap social media exposure, Oshagan Serpazan remains faithful to the above mentioned definition of leadership. Influencing the thoughts and the actions of others towards a new place or different outcomes. You do not need to physically see Serpazan to know or recognize him. His presence in our church is immense and it is right in front of us that we don't even realize it. When you go to your respective parish next Sunday, pay close attention to the scripture readings. They are translated in modern-day Western Armenian from the original Greek and Hebrew, not just word for word, but with added dynamic meaning. In that moment, take a second to remember that the beautiful translation is the result of the hard work of Zara Serpazan and Toshara Serpazan. And while you're at it, extend your hand and reach out to one of the blue Badarak books. Open that book and you will see four columns, classical Armenian, modern Armenian, English translation, and English transliteration of divine liturgy. That professional publication is also the work of Oshagan Serpazan. And what many of you might not know, Oshagan Serpazan is a trained musicologist and has dedicated much of his time preserving our ancient Shadagans. Many of the shotguns of our church were not available on paper. They were oral traditions being passed on from generation to generation. Because of this, these hymns were not being sung consistently from country to country or even from church to church. Oshagan Serpazan realized the imperative need to put down on paper the notes and the words of these shotguns so that they could be sung according to our Salesian tradition and not be corrupted and or eventually lost. As a result, you will find eight published volumes of our Sharagans by Oshagan Serpazan. The significance and importance of this project cannot be overemphasized. This is another epic task that required Oshagan Serpazan spending every summer, supposedly his vacation, working on this project. This was even before the widespread use of computers. For him, for him, each page of the hymn 
book meant hours of tedious work, preparing each page by hand, ruling lines, drawing notes, and pasting the words syllable by syllable in the proper position under the notes. Each page easily required a minimum of seven hours of intense hard work. The resulting volumes is testament to his accomplishments as a musician and artist, and most of all, his devotion to the Armenian church and its traditions. He is continuing the project with the use of modern technology in memory of Zareh Sarpazan. And if, and if you are anything like me, if you have ever attended an Armenian school in Syria or the Middle East and learned anything about your church and your faith from religion textbooks, know that those 12 volumes of textbooks were prepared by Oshagan Sarpazan single-handedly during a summer break to ensure that Armenian students will have the opportunity to continue to learn about their faith defying the ban that the Syrian government was implementing at that time. Those textbooks are still being used to this day, the result of many sleepless nights. If you study all the above projects, you will see that Oshagan Sarpazan is a leader who thinks long term. He makes his investment in what will eventually benefit the church for the infinite future. When I reflect on Oshagan Serpazan's work style, I remember the story of Mary and Martha of the Gospel. Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. Mary chose what was permanent while Martha was overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day tasks. The day-to-day -day tasks are important to keep our church and our organizations running but sometimes they make us focus on the here and now and hinder us from planning for the future. Oshagan Serpazan's monumental work and his investment in the life of the church will greatly benefit future generations. But Oshagan Serpazan is not only a man of books. You will always be a student when you are around him. When he visits St. Sarkis, for instance, on Sundays, I always ask him, and his answer is always consistent. And you get the butterflies in your stomach. At the end of Badarak, you will meet him at, at, at the office and he will give you his honest feedback and constructive criticism. Ojalan Serpazan has a dry sense of humor. I was sitting next to him during a social function one day. When the church service, I'm sorry, when the church server with not perfect singing qualities approached him and said, Sir Pazan, do you hear the improvement in my singing? I have been taking singing lessons. Oshagan Sir Pazan replied instantly and said, it sounds like they're not as your music teacher. <laughs> Oshagan Sir Pazan also has his unique ways of communicating delicate messages. I started releasing my podcast in 2014, and those who have listened to any episode, they know that my music selection can be a little edgy for a church podcast. After releasing two or three episodes, Oshagan Sarpazan stopped at St. Sarkis Church with a gigantic Duane Reed shopping bag and dropped it on my desk. I opened the back and I saw over a hundred classical uh, albums, CDs of Beethoven, Bach, Tchaikovsky, Chopin, and the likes. I looked at Serpazan and he said, this is my gift to you. Use this music for each <laughs> I feel blessed to call Oshagan Serpazan my boss. He is a talented and skilled clergyman whose journey began 50 years ago when he was ordained as a priest in the Armenian church. His vocation to become a priest was, not, was the result of the seeds of faith that was sown in his heart because of his parents and because of the environment where he grew up. Church, Armenian schools, national institutions, respect and devotions were values that were instilled in the heart of young Manuk. Oshagan Serpazan remembers that as a child, he and his siblings would celebrate mock badaraks, 
where one of the brothers would be the priest, another would be the deacon, a choir director, etc., etc. What is surprising in this story is that Oshagan Serpazan would be the one to pass the plate. Oshagan Serpazan's vocation grew as he became a seminarian. He was ordained a priest on June 4th, 1967. From 1968 to 1970, he attended the American University of Beirut, where he majored in history. From 1974 to 78, he attended Princeton Theological Seminary, where he majored in education and psychology, earning a master's degree. He continued his studies at Princeton, where he earned a second master's in the history of the church. While in Princeton, he was appointed to serve in various capacities in our Eastern Prelacy. He spent summers at Camp Hayastan as a counselor and teacher. Some of you in this room might remember him and his dynamic presence at those campgrounds. In April 1980, he was appointed pont Pontifical Legate to Kuwait and the Arab Emirates. One of the most significant moments from his tenure in that region was the Gulf War of 1990. Oshagan Serpazan was visiting the United States when the war started, but he found the means to return back to his flock. He put his own life at a great risk to provide for the needs of his people and strengthen, strengthening them in faith and hope. He was elevated to the rank of bishop in 1994, and in 1998, he was elected to serve as the prelate of the Eastern Prelacy. In these last 20 years, we have witnessed great development and enrichment in our prelacy and our parishes. This includes recruitment and training of new clergy, youth ministry, new publications, and learning opportunities in faith and culture. In my first podcast and the interview with Oshagan Serfazan, I asked him, who is your favorite saint and why? His response, Mesrop Mashtots, because he invented the alphabet, translated the Bible, wrote and composed Sharagans, and gathered a group of students who continued his work and created the Golden Age. And when you look at the life of Oshagan Serpazan, you can't help but see the parallel path of his service to the Armenian nation and that of Mesrop Mashtots. Serpazan Hayr, on behalf of your flock, I would like to congratulate you on this momentous occasion. You are a role model for clergy like myself, one who embraces the modern day times, but is steadfast in our Armenian apostolic church traditions and values. I would like to close with the following words of Oshagan Serpazan. Situations and conditions did not make me a priest. My faith, my church, and my people, they made me a priest. Serpazan Hayr, and I know this is your line, may God bless you and grant you a long and healthy life as you continue to serve God, his mission, and inspiring those that are serving God and the Armenian church. Thank you.